Well, glory. Thank you for watching tonight. Glad that you tuned in to watch our Sunday night service. It's a beautiful day, and I'm glad you're taking time out to sit there by your computer and watch us. I think we got some good teaching for you tonight. Let me just give you a couple updates on some announcements that I made this morning. As most of you know or have heard by now that we're requiring people to wear masks when they come to church. Um, again, the reasons that we're doing that is because of the outbreak of the coronavirus in Greenbrier County, where one church, a church I'm very familiar with, a good church in the community there, uh, was diagnosed, I think now with 34 positive tests for the coronavirus. And the news media kind of just laid them down the river and uh, said some unkind things about not adhering to some of the protocols that were laid out. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But then when the governor said that all people who come to church, I think he said this on Friday, when they come to church, they need to wear a mask. Now, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, that we are to obey those that have the rule over us, that we might live a life of peace. And so when the government tells us to do things, even though we may not agree with it because we live here, the Bible tells us that we need to honor them as long as they don't tell us to do something that's contrary to God's law, or contrary to the scriptures. And so having heard that, I began to think about what's best for the church. And that's a problem that we all have. We all have a rebellious attitude, and none of us like wearing the masks to begin with. They're very uncomfortable. They're very hot. They make it hard to breathe sometimes. And so I had to weigh what's best for the church, what's best for the Christ, or what's best for Christ. And that's what we always have to do, because it's not about what I want. It's not about what I desire. When it comes to our church, we're talking about a, an organism that's alive, an organism that has a impact in the community where it's situated. And so we need to do everything that we can as individual people to protect the testimony of our church. That's what we have to do. We have to protect not just the testimony of the church and the community, but also we have to protect the reputation of our Lord, that we are obedient to the things that he tells us to do, obedient to the scriptures. And so we have to be willing to set aside our own liberty, sometimes even our own pride, to say, I want to honor the Lord, I want to honor the scriptures, I want nothing to happen that would hurt the uh, reputation of our church. And that's really the bottom line. That's the bottom line. And so if something would happen here at our church, and heaven forbid that ever takes place, and we had a coronavirus outbreak here in our church, as the people begin to scrutinize, as they invariably will, and they see that we are adhering to all these different protocols, they won't be able to find anything that they can say that we didn't do right. Again, we're uplifting the name of Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about what you want. It's what's best for the church and what's best for Christ. And are we honoring him and honoring the scriptures? And so at least for a while, we're going to request people to wear masks. Nobody's going to be a mask policeman. Uh, if you take them off while you're sitting here, that's between you and the Lord. But when you come in and when you leave, you have them on. And so that's important, uh, that at least that you know why we're doing what we're doing. Also, announcement that came out earlier today that if you are a, a committee head, or you have a, a department head, the budget's coming due probably in the middle of this month, maybe next month. And so if you want to uh, have a budget for your committee, you want to add something to your committee, make sure you have that done and given to the treasurers of the church so they can take it to the budget committee and have an idea of what our budget's going to be for next year. Also, I mentioned this morning that the, the picnic that we have scheduled for the 12th of July is no longer scheduled for the 12th of July. We've moved it sometime in the future. Can't tell you exactly when because we don't know. We're just going to have to ride this out and see where things are, and then maybe by this fall we can make a choice of having it. We have a lot of warm days in the fall, and so we'll just wait and see what the Lord has for us. All right, well, let's go ahead and start our service tonight with a song. And the song is, O oh Lord, You're Beautiful. You're beautiful 
beautiful Your face is all I see And when your eyes are on this child Your grace abounds to me Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this evening for the opportunity that we have to gather together. We thank you, Father, for the joy that we have in Christ, knowing who he is. And Father, we know who he is through the word of God that you have inspired, that you have preserved for us today. We thank you, God, that we hold your word, which is the direction book of life. And Father, we just ask you to continue to guide us and direct us. Let us be drawn closer to you. And as we're drawn closer to you, Father, help us to just exalt the name of Christ, that he might be glorified in all that we say, all that we do. It's all about Jesus, not ourselves, but it's all about him. And so, Father, we just ask you to be with us tonight, be with all these folks that are watching via the internet. Just pray, Father God, that we might be renewed and strengthened for the week that lies before us. Help us to be bold witnesses this week for the cause of Christ. And so, Lord, we just pray that you might be glorified again by all that we say, all that we do tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have one more song. Jesus, keep me near the cross.
singing though I miss having everybody here lifting up our voices and singing it's just a lot of times you feel really good I know when our choir sings I can really feel worship when they're singing I just love that all right I'm going to ask you to maybe get a sheet of paper or maybe a tablet or something to have at your table at home I'm going to be giving a lot of verses as we go through this idea that we're going to be looking at tonight and so uh, you won't be able to look up all these verses a lot of the verses I'll have up on the screen that you can see at home and so we'll try to go through some of these as much as we can. Tonight I want to talk about an area that has begun to infiltrate the idea of fundamentalism, and it's the idea of Calvinism. Calvinism is a, uh, a thinking that's really involved more of the Reformed theology than it does the dispensational theology, though a lot of dispensationalists are holding on to the five points of Calvinism. Calvinism has a lot to do with how a person is saved. And so really it has a lot to do with the gospel, how the gospel is presented. And so tonight I want to show you why I believe that Calvinism is wrong. It's contrary in my understanding to the teachings of the scriptures and we're gonna go through the scriptures and I want you to see for yourself why it's contrary to the scriptures. We as God's people need to be able to defend the faith that was once given. We need to be able to say, thus saith the Lord, and we need to go back to the scriptures. And if something doesn't line up with the scriptures, it doesn't matter how great of a theologian somebody might have been at one time. We have to say to ourselves, it doesn't match up to the scriptures. That's our litmus test. That's how it has to be. Dr. Lorraine Boatner, in his book, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, says this. He says, the Calvinistic system especially emphasizes five distinct doctrines. Five distinct doctrines. And these are technically known as the five points of Calvinism. The five points of Calvinism. And they are the main pillars upon which the superstructure rests. So in other words, you have these five pillars that hold everything up. Calvinism follows if, if A is right, then it comes to B. And if B is right, it comes to C. But if A is wrong, then B, C, D on down are going to be wrong as well. Today, in many of our circles, you have people who say, well, I'm a, a five-point Calvinist or I'm a four-point Calvinist. A lot of people will say they're a three-point Calvinist. What do they mean by that? Well, <clears throat> what we've done is taken the, the acronym TULIP, and that's what not just me, but a lot of theologians and Bible, teach, Bible scholars and teachers have done, and they give us the pillars of Calvinism based on the TULIP. So let me just go over these with you real quick. The T in TULIP stands for total depravity or total inability, total depravity or total inability. And so that's one of the things that they hold to. We'll talk about these each individually as we go through them tonight. I don't know whether we'll finish tonight, but we'll try to get through as many as we can tonight. And then the next letter in TULIP is the U. And uh, Calvinists believe not only in total depravity in that sense, but we, they also believe in unconditional election unconditional election. There's no conditions for God's choosing. That's what the word election literally means. Don't be afraid of the word. It simply means chosen. We're elect according to God. We're chosen according to God. And so you have the T, you have the U, and now you have the L in TULIP, which stands for limited atonement. Limited atonement. We'll talk about that more, but limited atonement simply means that God only died for a limited few. He didn't die for the sins of the whole world. He simply died for his elect. And so we're going to be talking about that here this evening, hopefully. 
And then we have the I in TULIP, which stands for irresistible grace. God saves you whether you want to be saved or not. But the thing of it is, in Calvinistic thinking, uh, those that are his will want to be saved, and I would understand that. And then the last pillar that we'll talk about is the P, and that's the perseverance of the saints. And we'll talk about that more when we get to it. But let's start out, first of all, by looking at the first of the five points of Calvinism, the idea of total depravity. Total depravity or total inability carries the idea that a person who's lost cannot come to Christ and trust him as Savior unless he is foreordained to come to Christ because he is totally unable to come. He's totally depraved. Let's talk about total depravity for a minute. Total depravity does not mean that you are unable to do something. Total depravity means from my toes to my very head, I'm tainted by sin. That's total depravity. I'm not as bad as I could be, but I am a sinner. I am totally depraved in that sense. Total depravity does not carry the idea of, of inability. We're going to be talking about that just in a minute. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And so the heart is what controls us. And the Bible says very plainly here in Jeremiah that it is deceitful, and we know that to be true from experience, and it's desperately wicked. It's desperately wicked. A preacher one time brought a wonderful sermon on the depravity of the human heart. And when he finished his message, someone came up to him and said, you know, I want to know, and I want you to know, that I can't swallow this idea of depraved heart. And the preacher said, you don't have to worry about swallowing it because you were born with it. You were born with a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You already have that. Now, while the Bible teaches the depravity of the human race, and we're seeing that here about our heart being wicked, it nowhere ever teaches total inability. The Bible never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, Hints that people are lost because they have no ability to come to Christ. Sometimes we'll look at this verse later on. But it says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. And because we are dead in our trespasses and sin, we can't come to Christ. Because dead people do absolutely nothing. Dead people can't do anything. We'll talk about that verse just a little bit more when we get to it. But... The Bible does teach that man is depraved, but it never ever hints that people are lost because they have no ability to come to Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 40, he says, and you will not come to me that you might have life. You see, you will not. It shows volitional intent. Jesus is saying, you could come to me, but you've chosen not to come. You will not come to me. It's not a matter of whether or not you can come to Christ. It's, the, it's a matter of whether or not you want to come to Christ. That you want to come to Christ. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, as he's looking at the crucifixion looming over his head in the next week, he looked over at Jerusalem as he's on the side of the hill there at the Mount of Olives, and he said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Now get this part, but you were not willing. And so total depravity means that we are sinful. We have a deceitful heart, and it's desperately wicked. But it doesn't mean that we are not able to come to Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 5, and he says it here in Matthew 23, here he's talking about the Jewish people, they would not come to him because they chose not to come. They were not willing to come to Christ. He said, you know, you don't want to come, that's why you don't come. He did not say, how often would I have gathered you together, but you could not come. He said, you were not willing to come. And so, no matter 
It's not a matter of, of whether they could. It's a matter of whether they would. And so when we're thinking about total depravity, the idea of inability, the idea of not being able to come to Christ, simply isn't taught in the scriptures. Jesus taught something totally different. Jesus said, whosoever will may come. We'll look at that in a few minutes in Revelation. And so it's not a matter of whether they could. It's a matter of whether they would. And Jesus said, I would gather you unto myself, but you chose not to come. You would not. You made a volitional choice. You chose not to do it. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, the Bible says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. This is the last invitation in the Bible. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Whosoever will desires let him take of the waters of life freely let him come so jesus is saying here in the last invitation in the bible that it's a matter of the will and so there is no inability jesus is saying here that whosoever will whoever desires can come to me and so if it is true that no person has the ability to come to christ then why would jesus say in five Chapter 5, verse 20 of John, you will not come to me. Why did he simply say, you cannot come to me? Because they mean two different things. He said you were unwilling to come to me. He didn't say that you could not come to me. And by the way, the Bible never tells us to do something that we can't do. God never commands us to do something that we are unable to do. He just doesn't do that. So the only thing that stands between the sinner and salvation is the sinner's will, his desire to come to Christ. God made every man a free moral agent. The Calvinists will say, well, you're free to choose whatever you want, but you are not free to choose Christ. That, my friends, is not taught in the scriptures. We are a free moral agent to choose. And God never forces the human will to do anything. He leaves that up to us. Leaves that up to us. D.L. Moody was preaching back in the 1800s. He was preaching at a large revival service. And he said to these people, I want to talk to you about the word believe, the word receive, and the word talk. And when Mr. Moody had finished his sermon, he asked, now, who will come and take Christ as our Savior? And this one man stood up and he said, he said, I can't. And Moody said to him in front of all these hundreds of people, he said, don't say I can't, say I won't. And that's true. And then, of course, many people stood up in that same meeting and said, I want Christ. I want Christ. I'll take him. I'll take him. I'll take him. And so people are lost today because of their own choice of not choosing Christ. Jesus said it so plainly, you will not come to me because you choose not to come to me, that you might have life. Sometimes Calvinists will use John chapter 6, verse 44 as a text. The Bible says that no man can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him. But the Bible makes it perfectly clear in John chapter 12. Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And so Jesus has drawn all people to himself. The cross, when he was lifted up, he draws all men to himself. And so people are being drawn to Christ. All men are drawn to Christ, but not all men will trust Christ as Savior. But all men are drawn to Christ. Because Jesus said so in John chapter 12. You have to believe what the scriptures say. Yes, all men are drawn to Christ. That's the Spirit's job, is to draw people to Jesus. To convict people. But then again, we're free moral agents. We have the ability and we have the right to choose. Jesus said, I would give you life, but you would not come. How often I would want to take you and hide you under my wings, but you would not. I wanted to, but you chose not to. You chose not to. Every man makes his own decision about Christ, either to receive Christ or reject Christ. And the Bible makes it clear that all men who have ever been born have a light. 
In John chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, that was the light, the light which gives light to every man coming into the world. The Spirit of God lights up everybody today. Everybody knows about things. Let me give you an instance here in Romans. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, a suppression is something that they do, they choose to do, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. In other words, God has placed within everybody an understanding that he is. And people understand that he is, but they suppress that truth. Why? Because they choose to. Because we are free moral agents to receive or reject. But God has placed it within everybody's heart. We call it a conscience, if you will. The fact that he is there. That's why the Bible says that only a fool says in his heart that there is no God. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 20 of chapter 1 of Romans. Paul goes on to say, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The word power, I should say, the word Godhead carries the idea of deity, so that they are without excuse. All men who come into this world have a light. All men who come into this world have been given an innate desire to know that God does exist. And God has given evidence of his existence in creation. And that's what this verse tells us. That the invisible attributes are clearly seen by the things that are made. And even seeing creation, we understand that we can see God. We can see his eternal power in God. When you look at the stars and you see the universe, you see the power of God. You see the power of God. And this verse tells us you can see more than just the power of God. You can actually see God himself, his power and his Godhead. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 29, the Bible says, Come to me. This is Jesus giving an invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Well, if you can't come because you're totally depraved and totally unable to come, this verse makes no sense at all. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Remember, God never tells us to do something that we're unable to do. Jesus is giving an invitation here for people to come. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that all men can come if they choose to come. That people are not unable to come. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 tells us, and you were made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sin. And I've heard many people take this verse and run with it. And they would say, well, you know, when you're dead, you can't do anything. Most of us have been to funeral homes and we've seen somebody laying in a casket. And you can't converse with that person. You can't uh, do anything with that person. He's not recognizing your existence because he's not there anymore. Just the shell that held him is there. And so what they say, salvation is like that. Dead people don't do anything. Dead people are unable to respond to Christ. And so a Calvinist would say that you have to be born again first, you have to be made alive, and after you're made alive, then you can choose Christ. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches to believe, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can receive eternal life. And so life doesn't come before belief. Belief comes before life. But this is the idea of, of death. They use death as a, as a metaphor to being unable to come to Christ. I'm sorry, that's not there. In the Bible, death carries the idea of separation, not inability. Separation. And so when a person dies physically, their soul and their spirit is separated from the body. When a person dies spiritually, when they're born into this world, they're born into this world as a sinner, and they're separated from God, body, soul, and spirit. They're separated from God. And when a person dies eternally, heaven forbid... Their body, soul, and spirit is separated from God forever. And so death doesn't mean inability. Death means separation. And you have to understand that from the scriptures. Otherwise, you're going to get confused by what the scriptures teach. And so in the final analysis, 
In the final analysis, men go to hell not because of their inability to come to Christ, but because they will not come to Christ. It's a matter of their choice. It's a matter of their will. I think the teaching that men and women and children are totally unable to come to Christ and to trust him as Savior simply is not a scriptural doctrine. You don't find it in the Bible. And you say, well, Pastor Tim, why is this? Because this affects the very gospel itself. If they're teaching that you can't come, it's almost like they're, be, they're presenting a different gospel than what Jesus said. Whosoever will may come. You know, but you chose not to, but you can come, but you choose not to. And to teach that you can't come because you're unable to come simply isn't taught in the Bible. We as God's people today need to be able to stand up and defend what the scriptures say. Thus saith the Lord. And God's people should stand up and say, when they hear something, that's just not right. That's not quite ringing true. And we have to go back to see what the scriptures say. And so men are dead in their trespasses and sin, and dead men do nothing is a concept that is not found in the Bible. Because death never refers to inability. Death always refers to separation. And so that's the T. That's the T, the total inability or total depravity. Let's look at the next one, and that's the U. Unconditional election. Unconditional election. By unconditional election, Calvinists mean that God has already decided who will be saved and who will be lost. Wow. And the individual has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's wholly on God's part and without God's condition. God's choice altogether. And so, in other words, God has chosen some to go to heaven, and God has chosen some people to go to hell. Some people call that double predestination. That's not taught in the scripture. And so some are chosen for heaven and some are chosen for hell is not a doctrine that's taught in the Bible. That's the idea of unconditional election. You don't have to do anything because God in eternity past already decided who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Unconditional election. And if you just think about it, it absolutely disagrees with the often repeated invitations that we find all through the scriptures of, of sinners to come to Christ and be saved. I mean, when I preach on Sunday morning and I give an invitation, who's, uh, will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you're Calvinist, I can't say that unless God makes you alive first. I can't offer you something that God may not have offered you first. I can't offer you salvation if you're not his chosen one. So I can't give an invitation. John Calvin in his writings, the Institutes, book 3, chapter 23. I think I have it. This is what he said. This is a quote directly from him, and he's, his teaching is what's used today. Not all men are created with similar destiny, but eternal life is foreordained for some, and eternal damnation for others. You see what he's saying here? That a man's eternal destiny is chosen by God, some for eternal life and some for eternal damnation. Every man, therefore, being created for one or the other of these ends, we say he is predestined either to life or to death. So if, if, if inability is wrong, Calvinism falls down. I really don't think you can be a three-point Calvinist or a four-point Calvinist. You have to be, to be a Calvinist, a five-point Calvinist. I believe in all five areas of tulip. And if you don't, then... You can't call yourself a Calvinist. You just can't do that. And so Calvinism teaches that it is God's own choice that some people are going to be damned forever. That God never intended to save them. He foreordained them to go to hell. And when he offers salvation in the Bible, he does not offer to those who are foreordained to be damned. It is offered only to those who were foreordained to be saved. Wow. Wow. You know, there is in the Bible the doctrine of foreknowledge. God knows everything that's going to happen. Up, anything that's possible to happen. God knows it all. God's omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, but he's also omniscient. He is all-knowing. God is in charge of bringing different people to fulfill his will. There's nothing that occurs to God that he doesn't know about. 
And so I have read different pamphlets and different writings of Calvinism, and they, they change it as life goes on. But I have this one little booklet that's entitled, um, let me find it for you. It's, a, it's, it's, it's simply entitled Tulip by Vic Lockman, and this is what he wrote about Calvinism. And under the point, unconditional election, he quotes Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And so God chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose some to be saved, and he chose others to be lost. But the problem with that is you can't stop in the middle of the verse. You have to read the rest of the verse. And the verse says that, yes, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. For what purpose? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so it has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with being chosen to be holy and chosen to be loving. That we should be holy and without blame before him. He says that we are chosen, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what that verse is teaching. It has nothing to do with the idea of being chosen before the foundations of the world for salvation. Because salvation is not in the context. Uh, the same point is found in this book in, in John chapter 15, verse 16. He quotes John chapter 15, verse 16 by saying, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Okay. That kind of backs up their thinking there. God chooses some for heaven, he chooses some for hell. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. A lot of Calvinists today say that God chose some for salvation, and the rest he simply allows them to go the direction that their natural inclination will take them, and that's to hell, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But if God intervenes in the lives of some people, he could save some, but the rest will go to hell. Again, there's more to this verse than we see. Because the rest of the verse says, you did not choose me, but I chose you for what purpose? And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And so here it has nothing to do with salvation again. It has everything to do with fruit bearing. With fruit bearing. He's appointed us that we should go forth and bear fruit. It says nothing about being chosen for heaven. It says nothing about cho being chosen for hell. It simply says that we're chosen to go forth and bring forth fruit. And that simply means that every Christian ought to be a soul winner. The fruit of Christians are other souls for Christ. Let me give you another verse. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. And so... It, God has appointed us to win souls. God saved us for a purpose. He's entrusted the gospel to his church. And we are to go out and preach the gospel to people. Amen? We preach the gospel to people. They hear the gospel. They choose to follow the gospel and follow Christ. And they get saved. But if people can't get saved unless they're chosen by God, first of all, then how can you go out and win souls? How can you offer an invitation that is an empty invitation if they have been chosen for hell instead of heaven. Nowhere does the Bible teach that God wills for some to go to heaven and others to go to hell. It simply isn't found in the scripture. The Bible teaches that God would have all men to be saved. He says that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He's not willing, that should be willing, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire is for people to be saved. We see the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God has made it available to all men. Anybody can get saved. Jesus on the cross took upon himself the sins of the world and paid a debt that men not kind couldn't pay. And so his desire is to see people saved. And Jesus said the same thing. I would wanted you. I would have come in and put my arms around you, but you would not. You chose not to. And no one then, beloved, is predestined to go to hell except as he chooses of his own free will to reject Christ who refuses to trust him as Savior. John chapter 3, verse 36, the Bible says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. There again is the idea of, of believing in Christ. 
Nothing, I think, can be any plainer. The man who goes to heaven goes because he comes to Jesus Christ and he trusts him as Savior. And the man who goes to hell does so because he refuses to come to Jesus Christ and will not trust him as Savior. <coughs> and so we have total inability or total depravity not found in the Bible. We have unconditional election that God chose some for heaven and God chose some for hell not found in the Bible. And so that brings us to the L of TULIP, and that's limited atonement. Limited atonement. That Christ died only for those that he chose before the foundations of the world. I mean, you could have some people in hell saying, well, you know, why am I in hell? If Christ died for the sins of the whole world, and my sins have been, Jesus paid my sin debt, he made atonement for my sins, and why am I going to go to hell? Why am I here in this place? Well, you're here in that place because you were unwilling to accept the pardon that was given to you. Jesus, he did not die for those he, he planned and ordained to go to hell. That's what they're saying. Jesus, the Bible tells us, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. How do you know that to him? Because, again, the Bible tells us. He didn't just die for the elect. He died for the sins of the whole world. Look at 1 John Chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation, he's the payment, for our sins and not ours only. Okay, maybe you could say he's talking about saved people that are, our sins. You know, here is John talking about Christian people. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And so when Christ was on the cross, Christ was paying a debt, not just for the saved people. Christ was paying a debt for the lost people everywhere. Everybody who has sinned, Jesus was bearing their sin, their guilt. Because he's the propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And so the teaching of Calvinism on limited atonement contradicts the express statement of Scripture that we find. Jesus didn't just die for a select group of people. He died for everybody. There's no way to get around what it says in 1 John 2, too. Uh, you can do all the gymnastics you can do to get around that, but when it says he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, it limits it, doesn't it, to the whole world. How about 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6? For there is one God, and it should be one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for how many? For this the elect? No, he didn't give... His life for just the elect, he gave his life for all. What does all mean? Well, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it was the whole world. That's everybody. So he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The Bible teaches that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. That's just what he did. Now let's look, let's look at another verse. John chapter 4, verse 42. Now they said to the woman, this is Jesus at the well of Sychar, with this woman that he meets, this wayward woman. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said. Remember, she had met Jesus at the well, and Jesus told her all the things that she had done, and she went back and told her people in her village, and they came out to meet Jesus. And they say, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ What's the last part say? The Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. And so Jesus, we find, didn't die for a select group. This idea of being limited. He died for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2 tells us the whole world. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 tells us all. And here in, in John chapter 4 verse 42, again we see that He's the Savior for the whole world. Let me give you another verse. I, know, I told you we're going to do a lot of verses tonight. But I want you to see that what I believe is based on Scripture, not based on what I think or what I feel. And we have seen and testified, John says, that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of what? Of the world. Of the world. Of the world. The Scriptures, I think, make it absolutely plain that Jesus came to save the world. John chapter 3, verse 17. We know John 3, 16 very well. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Not just a select group of people, 
but the world might be saved. God's desire is to see everybody saved. But they have the ability, because God made us free moral creatures, to choose. To choose Christ or reject Christ. But Jesus on the cross paid the sin debt of all men. And he said, it is finished. He paid it in full. Something that we couldn't do. Mankind couldn't do. He did it for us. And we have the choice to make now. Because God made us free moral creatures. To choose Christ or reject Christ. And that's what Jesus said as he stood outside Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If only you would, I would have done this. But you chose not to. You chose not to. I'll give you some more verses. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep. All includes all. We have all turned everyone to his own way. I'll tell you, I, I think that we have to be able to stand up and defend what the scriptures teach us all the time. We just have to do that. Let me give you one more verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for just the chosen? No. He might taste death for who? For everybody. For everybody. And so we have total inability, total depravity, if you will, the heart is wicked, but man is still able to come to Christ. He can come to Christ if he chooses to come to Christ. Unconditional election. God has chosen some for heaven, and God has chosen some for hell. They might debate that with you, that God has chosen some to be saved, and he allows the rest of them to go to hell. But either way you look at it, God chose them before the foundations of the world. And then limited atonement. That Christ only died for his elect. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Christ died for the whole world. Over and over and over and over again. And so we have the T, the U, and the L of TULIP. And let's go with the I. Irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. I don't think you find the word irresistible anywhere in the scriptures. What is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. We're saved by God's grace. He gives us what we can never deserve or earn. He gives us salvation based on the death of Christ on the cross. He paid our sin debt in full. And because they believe that some people are chosen for heaven, then there is a certain group of people that will receive his grace. And they're going to be saved. Whether they want to or not. But the idea there is that they're all going to want to be saved. Grace is irresistible. But the Bible teaches us that we can resist grace. I know people that have uh, fought the idea of being saved for years and years and years. They resisted God's grace. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 1 says, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. And so here's a guy who hardens his neck repeatedly. It says he often is rebuked because he hardens his, his neck. And so we can resist the will of God. Again, the idea of Calvinism rises and falls on these pillars. If the first one is wrong, then they're all going to be wrong as we go down the waterfall. They're all just wrong. And so some people say, I'm a two-point Calvinist, or I'm a three-point Calvinist, I'm a four-point Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist at all. I'm a Biblicist. I believe what the Bible teaches. I believe what the Bible teaches. And so I don't believe in the total inability of man. I don't believe in unconditional election. I don't believe in limited atonement. And I don't believe in irresistible grace. And so that brings us, I want to kind of go quickly because I'm running out of time. That brings us to the last one. And that's the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints. I do believe that when God saves an individual person, God keeps them saved. Amen? Amen. Because we're sinners. We can't keep ourselves saved. I mean, one day to the next, I could be lost because I have sin in my heart. My heart's wicked. Even though I've been saved, it's still deceitful. It still causes me to do things against God. And so I do believe that God keeps us. I do believe in eternal security. And the person that trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior has everlasting life and will never perish. That's what John 3.16 says. But the eternal security of the believer does not depend on persevering. 
It doesn't depend on the saint persevering. It depends on Christ. It depends on Christ. I am preserved in Christ. Saints don't persevere. Saints are preserved. We're preserved in Christ. The only reason that any of us are ever saved because we're in Christ. And when God sees Tim Dillon, he doesn't see the, the sinful Tim Dillon anymore. Because when I got saved, he justified me. He declared me righteous. He took my sins as far as east is from the west. He sees me as a saint. He sees me as a holy one. And he sees that because I am in Christ. And so when he sees Tim Dillon, he sees Jesus Christ. And so there is no way that I have to persevere or keep on keeping on in order to be saved. I'm saved because I'm in Christ. The saints do not preserve. The saints are preserved. And there's a difference there. Uh, in Jude chapter 1, the Bible says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. Of course, he would be the Lord's half-brother. To those who are called, sanctified by the Father. And what's he say? Those that preserve, you know, persevere to the end are going to be saved. No, he says, those that are preserved in Christ Jesus. We're in Christ. He keeps us. He keeps us. And the moment I got saved, I, I was in Christ. He like preserved me there. And someday he's going to open it up and I'm going to be just as fresh as I've always been because I am preserved in Christ Jesus. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we see is this idea of Calvinism. These five areas that they, they hold to simply don't hold up to the scriptures. And you know, there's going to be people who argue with me. And really, we can get in depth and talk about each of these in minute detail. But I want you to understand that the Bible does not teach Calvinism at all. And we have gone through these scriptures, these, these main columns, these main supports for Calvinism, and they each are going to be falling down. They have no faith in themselves. And by the way, if the first one is wrong, the rest of them are too. They kind of flow down the hill that way. And so if you're able to come to Christ and you're not in, unable to come to Christ, then the first point of Calvinism is wrong. Total inability or total depravity simply isn't true. And we saw that to be true when Jesus said, hey, I would save you, but you would not come. You chose not to come. And so we've been looking in the last several weeks at different doctrines that are beginning to creep into uh, fundamental churches. The idea of, of annihilation in hell. We'll talk more of these in the future. You know, people think that people, God, who's a loving God, won't send people to an eternal place to suffer. That just doesn't make sense. It kind of goes against his attribute of being love. But that's what the Bible teaches. And so a lot of people say, well, if God is a loving God, he's going to throw you in the lake of fire and you'll cease to exist. And so people don't believe in eternal hell anymore. They simply believe in annihilationism. And they join people like uh, the Jehovah Witnesses who believe that. And so you have to be careful. We need to be able to defend what we believe in. And when a Jehovah Witness comes knocking on your door, you ought to be able to give them the answer to the hope that you have within you. Everybody should, but most people can't. So we talked about that idea of annihilationism. We talked about different ideas that we find that are being predominantly given into the church today. And it's, it's just sad that people believe that, you know, when you die, you simply go to sleep. They believe in soul sleep. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches nothing about soul sleep. The Bible teaches the Bible sleeps, but not the soul. So we need to be able to say, thus saith the Lord. And so I hope that you can understand that Calvinism does not hold up to the scrutiny of the scripture. And praise God for that. We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. And we can make that choice because God made us free moral creatures. And today, if you're listening to what I said, you have to understand that your eternal destiny lies in what you choose in this life. You can choose Jesus or reject Jesus. And that's going to have everything to do with where you're going to spend eternity when this life is over. With God or without God. It's a choice that you make. As Jesus said, I would have saved you, but you were not willing. You made your choice. 
Father, we thank you so much tonight for the word of God that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to, to look over these different doctrines. I know it was a lot, but Lord, I just pray that the folks were able to pick up different pieces and understand it and to be able to say, hey, I understand that. I can defend what I believe now. Help me, Father, to always be able to understand the scriptures. Let your spirit always speak to me and help me understand the truths and take those truths that I understand and apply them to my life and not just to my life, but allow me to share them with others. So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for a good day of worship. We thank you for just a good day to be alive in your presence. And, Father God, we'd simply ask you to give us this week opportunities. I know these are difficult times with people wearing masks and being careful where they go, but give us opportunities, Father, to witness for you that you might be glorified. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, beloved, thank you, and we'll see you Wednesday. Don't forget to wear your masks. <laughs>